this is um, lessons from a life in science, how to succeed in science, I suppose, is really, but you have to ex try to explain what you did. And I think one of the problems is that actual science, as we know it, proceeds very, 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 very slowly. And there are these every so punctuated by sort of amazing moments of clarity, which are what makes it all worthwhile. And I hope to be able to get some of that across to the young people. Thank you all very much for coming. It's nice to see so many young faces. Helps keep me young. The idea of this lecture is to tell you about my, well, sort of edited highlights of my career in science and some lessons that I think we can learn from it. And I should point out that the we, uh, one, of, one of the lessons, I think, is that you should choose your colleagues carefully. I was incredibly lucky with my colleagues because uh, here is Lou Reichard. He shared the same bench with me, and it was incredible luck. He was actually working on the heme problem but couldn't get it to work at all. Um, but he taught me how to make reticulocytes. So these are immature red blood cells still with ribosomes inside them that are giving this blue net-like stain, which is why they're called reticulocytes. Reticula means net in Latin. Um, and the other person who joined the lab a little bit later was Tony Hunter, a very distinguished uh, uh, a colleague. At the time, we didn't think we were anything special. But in retrospect, I think we were quite special, but we didn't know it. So um, the amazing thing about reticulocytes is that they're very easy to break open. Do you know how you break open a reticulocyte? You simply add water, take a packed cells, you spin the blood, you get a pellet of cells, you add an equal volume of water, all the cells burst, releasing all the hemoglobin, so you get this deep red. In fact, you can buy this stuff now um, from, from companies. And um, the amazing thing is if you add a radioactive amino acid to this mixture plus uh, what we used to call an energy generating system. Mm -hmm. For those who in the know, creatine phosphate and creatine kinase. Um, they synthesize protein at a rate. So this is protein synthesis, radioactivity and protein up the side, time in minutes along the bottom. And this rate of protein synthesis when you add heme is pretty much exactly the same as would have happened if you hadn't broken open the cells which is pretty remarkable since the concentration is only half what it was before you broke open the cell. Mm -hmm. But if you leave out the heme, protein synthesis starts off the first five minutes or so is fine, and then it sort of curls over and dies. And if you add back the heme somewhere around here, then it takes off again. So the heme somehow controls, it can reversibly control the rate of protein synthesis. Mm -hmm. So uh, as, a, as a graduate student, I went to another conference, this time in Greece in 1966. And I ran into this guy here, who was actually the head of medicine of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. And he and I just sort of liked each other and got on very well. And he said, why don't you come and work in my lab when you've finished your PhD? And I said, that's a great idea. But even greater would be to come and work in your lab this summer. Uh, and he said, well, yeah, why not? And so I went to New York for three months that summer and learned about American science. And uh, by this time, somebody else, a guy called Marco Rabinowitz at the NIH, had discovered that actually the basis of it was that 
in the absence of heme, an inhibitor formed, and the inhibitor blocked the very first stage of initiation. That is to say, it blocked the ribosomes getting onto the messenger RNA. So all the ribosomes came off, and uh, this was very easily repeatable, and uh, we, you, know, you could do that. But the question was, what was the inhibitor, and how did it work? And, um, you know, we were working in the dark, and it wasn't really a sort of, I mean, uh, most postdocs have proper advisors and stuff like that, you know. And, um, I didn't really, because Irving was setting up a new medical school at MIT at the time, so he wasn't there very much in, once I started on my postdoc. So I was just, you know, in control of the lab and totally out of control and lost. And the only thing that really, I mean, this was actually a nature paper, so it wasn't that bad. I went back to Cambridge and rejoined the lab that I had left as a graduate student. And by that time, uh, my good friend Richard Jackson was back there. Now, Jim Watson says that you should always try to work with people who are cleverer than you are. And this is very good advice. Uh, so we made an, uh, a, wonderful, a wonderful team. And we started to work on this problem of what the inhibitor was and how it worked and how he regulated it. And this actually was terribly important because it uh, allowed us a different assay for the inhibitor, which eventually solved the problem. But I'm getting ahead of myself because what actually happened next was that the lab burned down. And this turned out to be a very good thing. And the reason was because <laughs> we got an all new lab. <laughs> and six weeks later, we were back in business. Uh, not in this famous, this is the famous LMB, MRC, LM, Laboratory of Molecular Biology with 20 Nobel laureates in it. But our, our lab was sort of across the, where you're sitting, roughly speaking, on the opposite side of the road. But um, we were allowed to go and use the stores, which were down here, and we were allowed to join the people in it for our lunch. And this was a fantastic privilege. You know, I mean, these were the great pioneers of molecular biology. And you sat down at lunch, and they would tell you what they were doing, and they would ask you what you were doing. And uh, you know, you just and you told them and explained, and it was it, it, it was amazing. I mean, I had several conversations with every time I had a conversation with Francis Crick, he always made some really sensible suggestion. I learned an awful lot from that. And of course, we discussed among ourselves. And we had no idea, the younger generation, that we were in the same, you know, that we would be future Nobel laureates. We were just young scientists explaining to each other. So you know, I think uh, perhaps the most important thing as a result of the fire was actually the fact that all the previous data were burned. So we had a completely fresh start. We'd been terribly confused, and there was a lot of misleading stuff out there. And getting rid of that was good. But new surroundings, new labs, new neighbors, all new equipment, thanks to an insurance policy, wonderful stores, and as I say, the intellectual stimulation uh, led us to be able to solve our problem very quickly. So the answer turned out to be very simple. And we felt a bit stupid for not having realized it before. But the inhibitor was a protein kinase that phosphorylated EIF2. And actually, the, what was confusing us, so there are many of these things, as the, the one the kinase that's regulated, they all phosphorylate this initiation factor, the initiation factor that binds initiator tRNA to the 40S subunit. So everything made perfect sense. So what is a protein kinase? Um, it's just an enzyme that sticks phosphate onto other proteins, very simple. What does that do? It's incredibly important because it alters their properties or their behavior in some significant way, or in sometimes not. You can turn an enzyme on. You can turn an enzyme off. You can stick two proteins together to form a complex. Or you can make a complex fall apart, all by just putting on one or two 
phosphates, or you could tag a protein, and there are probably other things you can do. So the, the lesson here is that they, they're very versatile control elements, but what they actually do and how, how they work has to be worked out case by case by case. So um, I now have a problem because I've solved my problem. So this is a really serious business for a scientist. How do you find a new problem? Uh, what next? And I think I remembered in the back of my mind Borsuk's other problem, how protein synthesis turned on in sea urchin eggs. And I invited Tom Humphreys. Um, from Hawaii, who was the only person in the world I could find who still worked on this problem of sea urchin egg protein synthesis. And we became friends simply because he was a keen cyclist, wanted to rent a cycle, couldn't find a place in Cambridge to rent a cycle, so I lent him my yellow bicycle. And on that basis, a friendship was born. So the lesson is that uh, simple acts of kindness can pay big dividends. Because it turned out, I didn't know this at the time, that Tom was the director of a course in Woods Hole. And he said, why don't you come next summer to help teach the course, and uh, we can do some experiments together on sea urchin eggs. So I thought, that's great. You know, there aren't any sea urchins in Cambridge. It's miles from the sea. So I went, and it turned out to be very easy to get here. I am getting sea urchin eggs. You give the poor sea urchins a 12-volt alternating current electric shock. And males make sperm. First division after one hour, subsequent divisions every fifth, uh, half hour. So this guy, this enormous cell, is highly specialized for rapid cell divisions. And sure enough, if you repeated Borsuk's experiment, unfertilized eggs made essentially no protein. And when you fertilize them, there is a short lag, five to 10 minutes, and then whoosh, protein synthesis takes off. But it wasn't easy to find out what controlled that. And I went back two years later and helped to collaborate with uh, a graduate student, Eric Rosenthal and Joan Rudiman, who had discovered <clears throat> that in clam eggs, something slightly different happened. Instead of making more proteins, they made different proteins after fertilization. And that's shown here. There's proteins A, B, and C, which you can see. Well, maybe there's a little bit of C, but there's no A or B before fertilization. And this is what a clam egg looks like. And this was a clear example of translational control. That is to say, the messenger RNA for A, B, and C were already present here, but they simply weren't loaded on to ribosomes. So that was, that was the problem. How did that, how did that happen? But also an interesting thing that worried me was why did it happen? What, what did these, why was it so important to make these proteins after fertilization? So the other thing that you should know is that when these cells are fertilized, this is before fertilization, about 15 minutes or so after fertilization. I mean, there's an amazing, these, these two pictures are taken with the same kind of microscope. And you can see there's just a total reorganization of the cell. There's no trace of the nucleus here. This is, this is the nucleus, this is the nucleolus. Uh, this is a, a spindle, and these light things here are, are, are chromosomes. Um, when you think about it, that this must be some kind of modification of the proteins that are present here in a different form from how they are here. They just all behave quite differently. So um, a partial explanation was given by another seminar. So don't hesitate to go to talk sometimes. Not very often. Most of them are very, very boring. But <laughs> every so often, you hear a really good one which sows the seed of something important. And John Gerhardt gave this marvelous talk about frog oocyte maturation. So those clam oocytes, so they're really talking about the same thing, but you know, one is a vertebrate, the other is an invertebrate. Two million, two billion years of evolution separates them. 
he described this amazing thing, the MPF assay, so that the cytoplasm of a mature egg and injecting it into an oocyte, which triggered this, this transformation from one cell to, to another. And um, maturation pro promoting factor was actually, uh, it turns out, you could say the enzyme that catalyzes cell division. So I thought, what a delicious problem to work on. And um, it turned out the MPF wasn't just something you found in frogs. It was found uh, all across uh, the eukaryotic. And then three years after hearing that seminar, I did the Nobel Prize winning experiment, which was actually designed to test something completely different. But it was a very simple experiment. You add S35 methionine to the sea urchin eggs. You take out samples every 10 minutes and you analyze them on a one-dimensional SDS polyacrylamide gel. And what you see is that there is a protein which is very strong. It's a major protein that these things make after fertilization. But just before, this is the, the division of the, the cells, just before the division, the protein disappears. And then it comes back again, and then it disappears again. And every time the cell divides, and if you inhibit protein synthesis, the cells don't divide. So I saw this and I thought, wow, this looks, must be related to MPF coming and going. And we looked in clams later that summer, and to our amazement, it turned out that proteins A and B uh, also went away uh, just before the cells divided. So uh, suddenly, from being studying protein synthesis, I was drawn into studying the control of the cell cycle, about which I knew absolutely nothing. The answer came when uh, it turned out that cyclin joined together with a protein kinase that had absolutely no activity by itself. Cyclin was the activating subunit of a protein kinase. We were back to heme regulation all over again, except doing something completely different and something much more important and exciting. Um, and this is CDC2 on the left and cyclin on the right. And uh, it's just another protein kinase. I've compressed five years of hard and anxious work <laughs> into two seconds. You know, basically the idea is very simple. A cell makes cyclin, turns on CDC2, the kinase, the cells enter mitosis. The cyclin is degraded by a mysterious mechanism. CDC2 turns off and the cells exit mitosis. And uh, that's what you will read in all the textbooks today. What had seemed previously totally mysterious is actually very simple when you understand it. Just keep walking down the road and take, follow the path wherever it leads. And to be very humble and you know, don't, don't you know, explore side alleys because you don't quite know where you often, you know, when you're following the path, you don't really know where it goes. And uh, finding the main, main way is extremely important. But these little clues that you get along the way are, are, are the thing. And the thing that makes it uh, fun and the thing that makes you realize that you have to be very humble in the face of nature, I think. Thank you.